Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the launch of the Black to the Future Action Fund's Build Back Bold, a mandate from Black America for the Biden-Harris administration. I am your host, Jamel Hill. Now, as we all know, 2020 was a pivotal year for Black voter power. In response to the four years of a Trump presidency and a longing from generations for justice and equity in and for our community, Black voters mobilized to save ourselves. We organized, gave our neighbors rides to the polls, stood in line for hours, fought back against discrimination, misinformation, and other forms of voter suppression because we had a mandate to deliver. Now, tonight, we're unveiling that mandate, and it couldn't come at a better time. Over the weekend, uh, the Senate acquitted Donald Trump of the crimes he's committed against the nation. We can't wait, as we know, for goodwill. We can't wait for both sides. We have to make justice real for our communities. So tonight, you will hear from communities across the nation learning more about what we're facing, the opportunity in front of us, and the mandate to address the challenges that keep our families left out and left behind. We have some excellent, and I do mean excellent speakers on deck. And what we need from you today right now, this is the point where I ask you for something important, is to join us. So please, if you will, text MANDATE to 510-405, make sure I get this number right, 510-405-4549. Repeat, 510-405. 405-4549 to join our efforts to deliver a mandate from Black America and a thank you to the Black to the Future Action Fund for please convening us. Now, time to get on with the show. To kick us off tonight, I'd like to introduce someone who is just powerful in every possible sense, uh, Bishop William Barber, who is the co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign. Now, the Bishop William J. Barber II is the president and senior lecturer of Repairs of the Breach, co-chair of the Pe Poor People's Campaign, as I just mentioned, uh, a national call for moral revival, uh, bishop with the fellowship of the Affirming Ministries, visiting professor at the Union Theological Seminary, pastor of Greenleaf Christian Church, Disciples of Christ in Greensboro, North Carolina, and the author of four uh, we are called to be a movement, revive us again, vision and action and moral organizing, the third reconstruction, moral Mondays, fusion politics, and the rise of a new justice movement and forge together a moral message for the nation. So please welcome Bishop William Barber, who to kick off this conversation, um, Bishop, just for all of us out there, all those who are listening, all of us on the panel, can you just frame this moment for the country and why we can't afford to wait any longer for justice and all the other things I discussed in the intro. Well, thank you first of all so much for even including me. I'm, I'm so um, honored and I mean that. I say that to Alicia, my uh, dear brilliant warrior sister, I like to call her. And I'm so thankful to be in this with all of you. In fact, to me, um, you know, um, Alicia Bishop Yvette Flunder is actually my um, consecrating bishop and so on and she's a warrior in and of herself out in California you know this this uh, Bill Black Boulder I love it the three B's um, you know one of the things we have to hurry up and correct is, is you know we keep hearing people say things like the country is divided like as though it just happened <laughs> uh, and uh we, 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 we hear people talking about racism when they see that guy with the horns and not inside of the Senate. Uh, and that's racism for so many people. And that's, that's the residue um, of racism. And we, we oftentimes will, people will be quick to call someone like that a racist. But the fact of the matter is, I don't know if you knew this, but today, is the 27th, 20, 2776 days ago, the Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act in 2013, which means we've had three elections now cycles without the protections of the Voting Rights Act that was won 57 uh, years, 50, 56 years ago. And for instance, McConnell and others have blocked fixing the Voting Rights Act for 
2,760 days, seven years, seven months, and 28 days. Let me, let me just frame this. Strong Thurman, who everybody in history says was a racist, only blocked the, vote, the, the Civil Rights Act of 1957 for one day. One day, 24 hours. This current group of folk that may never use the N-word has actually blocked fixing the Voting Rights Act, <clears throat> which was called the most important victory than even any of the wars America had fought. Not only like that analysis, but it was said for 2,776 days, seven years, seven months, and 50, 20 days today, today. We know that as we are here today in the midst of all of the division and, and the hatred that we see in 68, 1968, Kevin Phillips, <clears throat> Richard Nixon, uh, and uh, Pratt Buchanan, Howard Dent, put a plan before Richard Nixon entitled Positive Polarization, where they actually said, if we follow this plan and we use code words to continue to promote racial animosity and, policy, rape, and, and racist policies, we can divide the country for the next 50 years and we will get the better half of the division. The division we see is not new, it's deliberate. It's not just Trump, he just inherited it and you cannot just talk about it in terms of party, simple left and right and Republican and Democrats. We must have what you all are talking about is this serious and fundamental uh, uh, race analysis and critique. We in the Poor People's Campaign, we declare that there are five issues at the center of America's continuing injustices that you cannot ignore. The first one is systemic racism in all of its forms, then systemic poverty and then ecological devastation, the denial of health care, the war economy, and the false moral narrative of religious nationalism. And the truth is, as one of the our um, PhDs in public health, the advisor of the Poor People's Campaign has said, Dr. Watson out of Harvard, she said, the truth is this pandemic has only exposed the fissures of systemic racism and systemic poverty, exposed it. I love what I heard you say, Alicia, when you texted me that this was about, we can't just say, go back to better, you know, just build back. Um, pre-pandemic, before the pandemic, why can't we just accept normalcy again? Pre-pandemic, 140 million people were poor and low wealth, 43% of this nation. Pre-pandemic, 700 people were dying a day from poverty, 250,000 people were dying a year from poverty, 62 million people were working for less than a living wage, 87 million people had either were uninsured or underinsured. Before this pandemic, we were spending $750,000 on the war economy, 54 cents of every discretionary dollar in the federal government going to the war economy, less than 16 cents going to education, healthcare, and infrastructure. We cannot just go back to what was. And then we had this false moral narrative of religious nationalism that actually suggests in some ways that racism <laughs> and denying help for the poor and being against gay people and being against a woman's right to choose and tax cuts and owning guns is in fact a godly and moral a set of public policies when in fact those policies represent a form of heresy as, as so far as, as, as a Christian might be concerned. In this moment, you all are so right. We must show how systemic racism and addressing it or not addressing it impacts the whole it was in the civil rights movement, they used to say, you can't keep me in the ditch unless you stay down there with me. For instance, we have found in our campaign, and we'll share some of these things with the data, you already have it, that um, every state that is a voter suppression state and every state where people get elected through racist voter suppression is also a low wage state, a high poverty state, an anti-union state, a bad housing state, uh, underfunding education state, uh, anti-LGBT state, and anti-immigration state, both in the state legislature and the congressional representation. So there's a direct connection 
from racism, systemic racist voter suppression to all of those other matters. And we know that racist voter suppression did not start with Trump. Since 2010, 26 states have passed racist voter suppression, and we already have 165 racist voter suppression bills now work, working themselves away through the state legislatures, even as the Voting Rights Act has still not been restored. We know that racism gets them in power, and then many people use that power in ways that hurt especially poor and low wealth people of every race. We also know that power building movements in those states that recognize the primacy and centrality of race is key to building the kind of moral fusion movement to produce the third reconstruction that America not only needs but must have. We can never establish justice as our constitution says or promote the general welfare unless we build black bold. There must be a specific focus on black people and black communities Systemic racist, racism and doing an analysis from that place has to address uh, police, yes, and prison reform, but it can't be limited to that. Or nor can it become the full extent of a policy response when people say that they want to address systemic racism. Take, for instance, this truth, poverty and low wealth numbers, 140 million people are poor and low wealth since, since uh, before COVID. 8 million have been added in doing that in before COVID, 26 million black people were poor and low wealth, but that's 61% of all black people. 45% of all black workers work for less than a living wage. In the pandemic, 25% of black households are behind in their rent or their mortgages are facing eventually. So you cannot talk about racial equity or even gender equity, but racial equity if you're not talking about living wages and guaranteed incomes. And, and housing and guaranteed health care for everyone. This is just an example. The truth of the matter, in every area, whether it's housing, wages, health care, tax policy, defense policy, environmental policies, education policy, immigration policy, there must be a systemic racism and a, bold, a bolder black agenda and an analysis. And truth be told, every dismantling of systemic racism down through history, every bolder black agenda has always been good, not just for black people, but for the entire nation. So Alicia and all of you, let me say something in light of this, rooted in something Dr. King said the night before he was murdered. He was preaching at that church and some people said he talked about the mountaintop. But what, he, but what he said is something I want to say to you in this endeavor, to all of you who have joined. He said, we must give ourselves to this movement. We either go up together or we go down together. And then he said, nothing would be more tragic than for us to stop at this point. Nothing would be more tragic than for you to turn back from this call for building black boulder. Hang in there, stay with it, we're with you. We've gotta do this, y'all. And God bless you for letting me just be a part of this beginning. Take care. Well, Reverend, uh, excuse me, Bishop Barber, as you only can, um, thank you for just helping us understand not only what's at stake, uh, but why we need to stay engaged in this fight and continue to plow ahead despite uh, many of the obstacles we know are sure to come. So we appreciate that word that you gave us. Um, next though, uh, turning the page slightly, I'd like to introduce Alicia Garza, principal at the Black to the Future Action Fund and the Black Futures Lab, host of Lady Don't Take No Podcast, and of course, co-creator of Black Lives Matter Global network. Thank you so much, Jamel. And thank you, Bishop, for giving us that word to kick us off. It was incredible. You know, we are here this afternoon to deliver a mandate from Black America to the Biden-Harris administration. Our communities are unwavering in our quest to bring dignity and justice and fairness and well-being to our communities. 
There's so much at stake and there is no time to wait. We are dying at astronomical rates, not just from COVID-19, which is attacking our communities, but from other preventable diseases and disasters due to a lack of adequate health care, due to climate change, due to economic injustice and poverty, and due to racism. The failure of our lawmakers to hold accountable those who would go so far as to try and overthrow the government demonstrates how important this mandate is. Perhaps they won't hold themselves accountable, but we certainly will. America has consistently failed to deliver on its promise to black communities. But when we are focused, when we are organized, when we are determined, black America has been successful in delivering on our promise to not rest until freedom comes. We pushed the Biden-Harris campaign to victory, not for them, but as my sister Latasha Brown says, for us, because we can't wait any longer, because we do have the solutions that will unlock the promise of America, because we have too much on the line to turn back now. I started the Black to the Future Action Fund because our communities are the promise of America. And it's why I'm so proud to announce our mandate for the Biden-Harris administration. They say build back better, but the truth is America cannot be better unless we are bold enough to make it so. That's why our call tonight is to build back bolder. In our mandate, we lay out a path for how to make black communities whole from city hall all the way to Congress. We have laid out an agenda for this administration in every aspect that you can imagine that impacts black lives, climate justice, racial justice, fighting back against white nationalism and white supremacy, economic justice, and a just and fair relief and recovery from COVID-19 for black communities. The Bishop is correct. What is good for black communities is good for all of America. And that is why we have to face this moment with courage, with innovation, and with a mandate to be bold, not just better. But don't just take it from me. Let's hear from some of the families across this nation. I'd like to introduce Nitris Holmes, who will talk to us about her story of what it means to be trying to be resilient in this moment in America. Nitris. Thank you so much, Alicia. Hi, everyone. My name is Nitris Holmes, and I currently reside in between Baltimore, Maryland and rural North Carolina. Um, so I've pretty much been back and forth since the pandemic started. Um, my family in North Carolina started experiencing the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic during October of last year. My mother and nine of my relatives tested COVID positive at the same time, which actually which actually landed half of them in the hospital at the same time. Um, while most of them recovered, um, unfortunately, I lost my uncle who was living with my mom. I remember my uncle being in the hospital, not being able to breathe. Um, he was in a lot of discomfort. The, the medical staff had to keep rotating him from his back to his stomach to his side because his lungs were filling up with fluid and he could barely breathe. Um, it had gotten to the point he was extremely uncomfortable and he started begging to die. Um, he couldn't be with family and he actually died alone. Um, the nurse called and told us that she was in there with him holding his hand as he took his last breath. And nobody's family should have to hear their loved one in pain and not be able to see them. Um, Back in August 2020, my mother, she actually had to retire six months early because she was afraid to go back to work. Um, she worked in childcare, which would actually put her at risk of exposure to COVID-19. At the time, she was 69 and she felt she was at risk because she had a couple of underlying issues and she didn't want a chance getting the virus. So she literally had to choose her health over her main source of income. This has put my entire family in a hard situation. Um, I don't want 
my mother to be here in North Carolina, where I'm currently at right now with her um, alone in the house. Um, but at the same time, I can't afford to move her back to Baltimore with me because I'm currently renting a small one bedroom apartment and I'm unable to move back to North Carolina to be with her due to my job. And the cost of living in Maryland is just so much more expensive. Even if I tried to upgrade to a larger space, it would be, the rent would be astronomical. Um, so I just feel like I'm caught in between a rock and a hard place. I feel like I have all the, these decisions to make and not too many resources. Um, I have become a unofficial caretaker responsible for making sure my mom gets her groceries because I panic at the thought of her going out to the grocery store by herself. Um, I make sure her bills are paid electronically because of um, a lot of the elders in rural communities, they still rely on USPS and which we all know, um, the mail has, system has been horrible since the pandemic and these large companies, um, they'll get the mail 30 days later, but they will still tack on late fees and or either cut your service off. So I've been pretty much maintaining, um, making sure the lights are paid, the phone bill, and most importantly that she maintains a roof over her head. Um, my level of anxiety is like through the roof now um, since this all started. I'm paying more out of pocket to keep my mother afloat and trying to keep her active mentally and emotionally. Um, it's hard because I'm pretty much, I'm back and forth from Halifax County, North Carolina to Baltimore um, every month. So I'll spend um, a week or two in Baltimore, then I'll come back to North Carolina. So I'm pretty much maintaining, trying to maintain um, two households. Um, all of her family were literally, well, half of the family um, were that were in the hospital with COVID, they were, um, they were in bad shape when they were in, in the hospital. It's been a complete nightmare. Um, I've watched my family get sick. Um, I watched friends get sick. And I've even had a classmate that just recently passed away from, from COVID-19. Our communities are being hit extremely hard and it it angers me and I'm so frustrated because all of this could have been prevented. The Trump administration, they kept everything from the American people. There was no education, no fast actions, and definitely not enough relief. Um, the Trump administration, they allowed so many people to die. And amongst those people was my uncle, um, he should still be here. My classmate should still be here, as well as over 400,000 Americans that passed away from COVID-19 should still be here. Um, all of these lives didn't have to be lost. And rural Black communities, like the one my family lives in currently, are being hit the hardest. There are so many intersections um, to the hardships faced in this pandemic. I just really hope that the Biden administration gets this country back on track. We definitely need another stimulus check. Um, in my opinion, we need one every month until everybody is able to get back on track. We need to raise the minimum wage, definitely. We need paid leave for folks who have lost a loved one to COVID. And we also need more access to food banks and support for families that don't qualify for public assistance. Um, the communities of color, we were already at a disadvantage, but since the pandemic, it's like now it's even worse. Um, it's just been a roller coaster of emotion. It's like, you just don't know what's gonna happen next. It's like one day your loved one is there and the next they're, they're sick in a hospital, unable to breathe and dying alone. And nobody should have to die suffering alone and unable to breathe. So we need to make sure we can prevent people from dying and that we get the relief we deserve. Thank you so much for having me. Um, this is an honor and thank you for listening.
to my story. Well, Nitra, thank you so much for sharing something that was so personal and so powerful. And it's just unfortunate because so many of us have similar stories. Um, my husband lost his grandmother to COVID uh, last year, just recently this month. A dear friend of mine, uh, COVID took him out in 12 days. He's two, two years older than I am. And uh, the untold or the told really devastation that this pandemic has caused will be felt for generations to come. And I understand that anger because I think a lot of us who have lost people or just simply witnessing this really understand it because all of this was so preventable. And it's really heartbreaking that when you're a citizen of this country and you poured your life, in many cases, your resources into this country and to see it abandon people at the worst possible time is very hard to take. And so I'm glad that you put a face to this devastation. We're praying for you. And we hope that if anything, people take away from this conversation, not just about the drastic consequences, but understand that it's important that we press and hold this administration accountable to do better by us because we all deserve that. And especially to do better by our community, which has sacrificed so much um, not just with the lives lost, but when you think about how we mobilized and organized and put them in the office. I mean, they owe us flat out. And so um, that's one of the many things that we're here to discuss. So thank you again, Nietzsche. We appreciate you sharing. Um, Very much. As you can see, um, as we just discussed and what Nietzsche just shared so eloquently and so powerfully, the situation in our communities is indeed drastic and we do deserve relief. It doesn't have to be this way. Uh, we know that when we come together, come together, when we organize, when we flex our power, there's nothing that we cannot accomplish. So take the pledge. This administration needs to hear from you that it's time to deliver real things to real people. So please text mandate to 510-405-4549 and take the pledge to join the fight to build black, build back bold. Um, when you take this pledge, you'll be fighting for relief and recovery for Black communities um, from the COVID-19 pandemic. You'll be demanding that everyone be able to stay in their homes. You'll be demanding equitable distribution of relief and recovery from vaccines to stimulus payments. Um, Natrice just talked about it. We don't need one time. We need monthly until this pandemic is over. Um, there's just so much more. Um, so take the pledge and join us because, again, we cannot afford to wait. Now, you've heard the saying that in crisis, there's always an opportunity. Um, too many today are restrained by what's possible, but what's possible depends on what, on who and what sets the agenda. The Build Back Bold mandate is driven by what Black communities know is possible. And joining us to discuss that tonight are some of the visionaries and strategists leading the fight for change. So let me first introduce Deborah Scott. Executive Director of Georgia Stand Up, a think and act tank, love the sound of that, for working families, and an Obama administration 2012 White House Champion of Change awardee, an accomplished advocate of universal voting rights, economic inclusion, and progressive civic engagement. She is a master organizer, a strategist, and a highly skilled trainer. Now, economic advancement and racial equity are at the core of New Scott's social vision, sustained by a passionate commitment to voting rights and community empowerment. Mentored by legends like Reverend Joseph Lowry and Reverend James Orange, her organizing skills, networking savvy, and collaborative style contributed to the massive voter mobilization that shifted, that shifted Georgia's political identity, uh, influencing the outcome as we all saw in 2020. Now, Ms. Scott lives by the quote of Shirley Chisholm, uh, my favorite and yours, I'm sure, service is the rent we pay for the privilege of living on earth. I love that. Uh, next, we have Aria Saeed, an award-winning transgender advocate and political strategist based in San Francisco. She is founder and executive director of the Transgender District, the world's first legally recognized district of its kind. Also founder of Black Transgender Women Empowerment Project, Queen Culture Initiative, and a board member of the Women's Foundation of California. Nse Ufout is the Chief Executive Officer of the New Georgia Project, NGP, and its affiliate 
New Georgia Project Action Fund. Uh, INSE leads both organizations with a data-informed approach and a commitment to developing tools that leverage technology with the goal of making it easier for every voter to engage in every election. INSE and her team are also developing Georgia's homegrown talent by training and organizing local activists across the state. She has dedicated her life and career to working on civil, human, and workers' rights issues and leads two organizations whose complementary aim is to strengthen Georgia's democracy. Under NSA's leadership, NGP has registered over 500,000 eligible Georgians to vote and no plans of slowing down there. So welcome to all of you and thank you for joining us for this conversation. Um, Aria, I wanna start with you. Uh, trans communities are often in the news when of course, when there's tragedy. 2020 saw a record number of trans people, predominantly black trans women, murdered. But as Raquel Willis reminds us, it's not enough to only consider the lives of trans people in tragedy. We have an opportunity to support trans communities in life. The issues impacting trans folks are impacting America. So how can we seize the opportunity to close the gap? Um, good evening. I think, um, Something I really love about the mandate in particular, the back to bold or bold to back mandate, excuse me, um, is that race does matter. Um, and something that I think we also have to consider is that when we pair race with gender, you know, Dr. Crenshaw teaches us about the experience of intersectionality. And um, I think for Black transgender people, in particular, Black transgender women, um, in order to imagine a world in which we're liberated, um, we have to create an environment that celebrates transgender people and invest in us economically. Um, specifically when we see the level of disparity that we face as a very, very small population in the United States and globally. Um, the reality is it's culturally, um, you know, we are sort of, cisgender people lack empathy for transgender lives. And I think in the political world, uh, we sort of get lumped into the LGBT experience and um, our, our issues that we're facing are not defined, um, specifically with being Black and being trans. Um, and so housing, healthcare, economic empowerment, a monthly stimulus would be great. Um, <laughs> at the bare minimum, our country should um, really shift from this experience of what can you do for your country and really prioritize what our country could be doing for us um, as people in, in this country. Just as a, a follow-up, uh, as you know, the, the theme of this is, you know, build back bold. So um, when it comes to racial justice for the Black trans community, what does that look like, build back bold? Um, I think every issue is a transgender issue, is a Black transgender issue. And, um, you know, the efforts and the, and the demands that we're asking collectively from student loan forgiveness to expanding Social Security payments, debt relief, um, moratoriums on, you know, utilities and internet until the country is in a different space economically during the pandemic. Those are all issues that we're seeing transgender people be impacted by just as, you know, other uh, Black people. Um, and I think uh, legislatively uh, having laws that are in place uh, that are minimizing um, unintended consequences of impacting us, um, especially around incarceration um, in, in relationship to Black trans people. Um, thank you for your your answer, your thoughtful answer. Deborah, I wanna bring you in now. Um, as you know, housing as a human rights issue has become a very signature issue, particularly as the global pandemic sort of exasperated uh, the longstanding attacks on our community infrastructure. Now, millions of people are now facing eviction and foreclosures and in communities across America, construction of market rate housing is booming while the economy is busting. You helped usher in a change in the balance power, balance of power in the Senate, as well as new leadership in the Oval Office. What was the opportunity that you saw in doing that? And how do we make the mandate real to provide affordable quality 
housing in our communities. Yeah, thank you so much for having me and, and really excited to be here today with all these leaders. Um, but we also we worked in the fields together. So this is not the first time we've been together. We've <laughs> been out in the trenches. And so Georgia Stand Up was happy to be a part of getting um, this agenda out there um, here in the Atlanta area. So the first thing I would say is if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And Black people have been on the menu for a long time. And so now, as Shirley Chisholm did, we have our chairs and we're bringing it to the table. And we're saying that we want affordable housing for our people. We are sick and tired of our people being out in the streets unhoused. That's, so that's the first thing. And so we have to house our people. So we want this administration to really take housing seriously. So we have some suggestions. First of all, they need to have a regional conference on housing and affordable housing in this country in every single region. And they can do that right now. Just convene the meeting. It's going to be on Zoom and pull the experts together on a regional level and find out what the problem is and let's solve those problems. So we need those um, regional conferences, but then we need the listening sessions. We need governmental officials to come to these regions and listen to what's happening on the ground. All politics are local and locally we have the answer. So we want people to come back to these community-based organizations in their regions to ask them, what is the problem and what is the solution? Because we have them. The other thing is we want to make sure that they eliminate the um, um, mortgage interest subsidy. That would create another pot of money for affordable housing, and that needs to be done ASAP. In addition to that, Freddie and Fannie Mae um, has, have been under attack, and if we um, we fulfill the promise of affordable housing, we need to instill and, um, and, and reactivate Fannie and Freddie Mac. And then we need incentives to be able to turn affordable housing from market rate to affordable housing. We have malls closing all over the region. And so that's vacant space where people are living in the streets. So we're saying that you need to modify some of the inclusionary zoning policies so that you can actually get people in affordable housing. And that means converting a mall or a retail center into housing that includes affordable housing, affordable um, health care, and senior health care. When we talk about rewriting the rules and rewriting the rules, we have experts already. As we said before, we want to make sure that we combine the experts on the ground with the experts that are actually in Washington to talk about solving this problem. If we don't name the problem as uh, housing is a human right and a problem that needs to be solved right now in the first 100 days, it will not go solved. We know even in Washington, D.C., on your way to the Capitol and to the White House, we're stepping over our homeless brothers and sisters. Hopefully they're stopping by and giving them some food on the way, but literally we're stepping over our brothers and sisters. We have to stop that. So here in Georgia, we did our thing. Thank you, Latasha Brown and Nse and Tamika and Helen and all the sisters and brothers that did work on the ground. But now we have receipts. And the re receipts say that we did the work and now we want what's coming to us. And of course, we want to be responsible with the in the way in which we roll this out. So that's why we come back to it all starts local. Ask us what we need and we'll tell, tell you what we need. Um, Deborah, well, more than well said, uh, well put. Um, as you know, though, in our communities, we talk so much about home ownership, but we don't talk enough about the rental market. What is the opportunity we have now to increase the supply of housing, not just to people who can buy it, but people for whom renting is their primary option? Yeah, so the problem is there's not enough affordable rental housing. And our housing um, authorities are literally giving vacant and abandoned properties away. And so we have to stop that. So we need a moratorium on all public, um, on the dismantling of all public housing. Do not tear down any public housing until there is a local review of what's happening there. In Atlanta, almost 10, 20 years ago, Hope Six came in and we dismantled all the public housing here. And so our folks that could not afford to get a, a certificate and go, a, a choice voucher and go somewhere else, they are literally living with other people and living on the street. So the first thing is your housing authorities that have been restricted need to be unleashed to really supply 
apply and build affordable housing. And then there needs to be an incentive for developers to actually create affordable housing. No more of this three for one replacement. It's one for one replacement. If you tear down affordable housing, you need to build affordable housing one by one. So we want a one by one replacement. And we want to make sure that we recognize that housing, jobs, and transit goes together. Here in Atlanta, affordable housing is on the south side, but the good jobs are on the north side. And the transit route is 90 minutes or 120 minutes to get there if you're on public housing. So it doesn't, it, it public, um, uh, public mm, transit. If it does not make sense, then the people that are actually your service workers on the ground will continue to suffer. So if we say that we care about the voters that put us in office and put them in office, then we're saying that the first thing you need to do is put roofs over people's heads. Housing is a human right. So we want to build back Boulder right now. Hmm. Um, I heard that. <laughs> uh, and say I want to bring you in now. Uh, New Georgia Project registered and activated millions of new voters, the base of which was multiracial. For the people that you helped energize to bring about a new democracy, what were the core issues that you found were most important to them? Um, so like most Americans um, in this particular moment uh, in 2020, uh, people were very concerned about COVID. Uh, when we look at a place like Georgia, uh, where we are rapidly becoming a, a majority people of color state, um, and then you think about how uh, Black Americans and Latinx and Asian Americans were disproportionately impacted um, by COVID and disproportionate and dying at higher rates, uh, hospitalized at higher rates, people were very concerned uh, and wanted to make sure that we had leadership uh, who took who listened to science who took COVID seriously. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, Atlanta is open, open. Um, it has been for quite some time. Georgia was the first state to reopen, uh, one of the last states to shut down. Um, and we see that reflected um, in our rates. People, uh, we see that reflected in um, the mortality rates. I think the second thing um, that across um, race, across gender, um, it was um, racial justice, um, that people were concerned about state violence um, against Black people um, and how unaccountable that seemed to be. There was, um, you know, we uh, we talk about, uh, we had a, we, we designed a pair of sneakers um, to give out to some of our most ardent supporters, our hardcore volunteers that said, from pandemic to protest, to the polls. Um, and that came from our research. Um, that's why I love being in community uh, with the folks from Georgia Stand Up uh, and the good people at Black Futures Lab, uh, because we are but we are we are the people that we organize with. We are the people that we organize for. And that is not enough to make us subject matter experts. We know what black people care about, what working families care about, because we ask them that there's a bold and aggressive uh, research agenda at the core of the work that we do. Um, and so thinking about, uh, again, black folks showed up to vote because of COVID. Um, the, the one slight difference I think I would add is that uh, there were, we did see gender differences uh, for women and femmes. It was COVID as a healthcare issue, right? How do I keep myself safe? How do I keep my family safe? Uh, and for men, it was COVID as an economic issue, right? Extraordinary job loss, um, um, housing uh, and, and houselessness um, that people are dealing with. Um, you know, the fact that uh, there's supposed to be a moratorium on evictions, um, but there are landlords all across the state of Georgia who ignore that. Uh, and we don't quite know, uh, and, and we haven't seen the enforcement mechanism to force landlords uh, to, to, to honor uh, the eviction moratorium and the foreclosure moratorium. So COVID, uh, racial justice, and then during the nine weeks, um, you know, we it, a lot has been written about the historic levels of participation. Black folks showed up in extraordinary numbers uh, for the January runoff to elect Senator Warnock and to elect Senator Ossoff. And the number one issue was the stimulus, right? That people, where is my money? 
Mitch Better Have My Money was by far our most uh, animating uh, hashtag that we put out there that we organize people around the message that we mo mobilize people around. And so wanting to make sure that our new president and vice president and the new Congress that we elected uh, go to DC and do the people's work. That there was no confusion about what black folks wanted. Uh, there's no confusion about about what promises were made when asking for our votes. And we are definitely now in the sort of build back bolder accountability phase. Okay, well, since you are in the accountability phase, uh, it sounds like these new voters that you brought in, that they won't be satisfied with just a better agenda. Uh, is it fair to say that they are demanding you know, bold solutions to the challenges that are in front of us. Absolutely. Uh, that, I mean, that is where we are. Bolder solutions where we are. I grew up in Atlanta, so y'all will pardon me for relying on King quotes uh, to make a point, but it's what we do. Um, and I, I think it's important, you know, the I Have a Dream speech, the actual working title was Normalcy Never Again. Right. And so I know that we're in the middle of a pandemic. I know that people are waiting for outside to get open again. I know that people are dealing with extraordinary loss, the loss of human life, uh, the loss of employment, the loss of income, et cetera. Uh, but returning back to normal is not an option because if we keep it all the way real with ourselves, what we had before wasn't working for our families and our communities either. Um, so I'm I'm excited and encouraged uh, by uh, this moment that we're in. I'm, uh, we have seen a, 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 an increase in the sophistication of, of, of voters and sort of their understanding of uh, where the, the lever, the points are, the, the pressure points are. Um, again, there is an agenda. Uh, there's often one of the ways that people try to deride a uh, movement and movement organizations is, you know, who are your leaders and what is it that you want and what's the black agenda? And we need an agenda. There is an agenda. It does exist. People are clear about the America that we want to live in and love in and raise our families in moving forward. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to be a part of this village. And this is what we're organizing for. Again, not normalcy never again. So uh, since you're, you know, excited and optimistic with the shift in the balance of power in the White House and obviously now also in Congress, um, what's your view of the opportunity that's, ahead, that's ahead of us in order to get some of these, um, bold changes in the ways, you know, we, we make rules? Um, and, and also, uh, how do you see it in terms of who gets to participate in this? Right. I mean, I think that that is one of the things that we are struggling with right now, right? That, um, tons of people sort of congratulated Black voters and Black organizers uh, for saving democracy um, and electing Senators Ossoff and Warnock to change the balance of power in the United States Senate. And immediately afterwards, there was an insurrection at the Capitol and, and white supremacist violence and domestic terrorism uh, that we saw at the Capitol sort of based on and predicated on this lie that there was voter fraud. It wasn't voter fraud. It's just that in this moment, because of vote by mail, uh, because people had clarity about uh, where the changes that we could make to stop all of the awful things that we were experiencing, um, we saw a surge in Black voters and Black participation. And now those same people who supported, encouraged, funded the insurrection at the Capitol on January 6th are now behind almost 200 voter suppression laws uh, being introduced in about 33 states. And so this is an attempt to mute Black voices, to suppress Black votes point blank period. Um, and so I think that when we think about what the opportunities are going forward, I think about HR1 um, or the For the People Act is what it's known. And it, it basically it is um, to strengthen the Voting Rights Act, uh, to expand mail-in voting. 
um, to prohibit the limitations that we're seeing on mail-in voting. In our state in Georgia, they're trying to get rid of drop boxes, require people to submit a, a photocopy of their ID to request a ballot and a photocopy of their ID to uh, submit their ballot and to make sure that it gets counted, right? And so HR1 uh, for the People Act would address that. I think that's HR4, which is the John Lewis Voting Rights Restoration Act. Um, again, uh, you know, we are talking about just over 50 years of full democracy, full participation. And what we are seeing now is an attempt to break the machinery of our democracy because Black people showed up and Black people participated uh, in our elections at historic rates. Um, and so HR1 and HR4 uh, are in the Congress right now. And I think that those are opportunities. I think that getting rid of the filibuster uh, is an opportunity. It's an antiquated uh, tool that is designed to make it difficult to get anything done, right? That if anybody has been in the company of a toddler, when they didn't want to do something and they lay on the ground and like, yell and, and throw themselves around um, that that's preventing anything from getting done. And that's what we're seeing um, with Republicans in Congress uh, and in state legislatures all across the country trying to stop uh, the, the machinery of democracy from working. And I think that we have an opportunity to fix that. I think that America hasn't had a raise in 12 years. Uh, in 2009, when the minimum wage was raised from like $6.55 to $7.15. And so we're talking about raising the federal, federal minimum wage to $15 an hour. I've already heard the streets are saying that, uh, you know, Members of the or people who claim to speak for the administration, members of Congress are saying maybe we can get 10, maybe we can get 11, but 15 might be a bridge too far. No, it's the fight for 15. And it's been the fight for 15 for a number of years. And so I think that that's an opportunity. And lastly, I'll add, I mean, there's so many more, but I will lastly add uh, student loan forgiveness. That when we think mm -hmm. about Black women uh, in particular, they, they are burdened, saddled with extraordinary amounts of student loan debt. And so we see student loan forgiveness as a racial justice issue as well. And quite frankly, we see a lot of the things that will support American families as racial justice issues. If it's economic justice, if it's healthcare, if it's climate uh, justice, that these all have racial justice elements. Um, and these are all opportunities uh, for the Biden-Harris administration to get it right. Um, well, thank you for laying those things out. And most importantly, thank you for telling people who, if they were under the impression and after what happened in Georgia, for that matter, the rest of the country, that there would not be a more pronounced and even more deliberate, uh, even more vicious attack on the uh, rights of black voters, then they were sorely mistaken because uh, sure enough, as soon as the smoke cleared just the tiniest of bits, um, they came back with a renewed and revamped Edwards, uh, revamped efforts, excuse me, in Georgia to make sure uh, that what happened in 2020 doesn't happen again. So um, I caution people to not just be on the lookout about that, but to stay organized, stay mobilized, um, and stay angry <laughs> because they're still keep, coming for the democracy and still coming for our voting rights. Just to keep your foot on the next. <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> it's not done. Our work is not done. Yeah. No, not, not by a long shot, unfortunately. Um, but listen, thank you and say, Deborah, uh, Aria, for such an inspiring conversation. And this is the point where I remind you again, if you haven't already, please take the pledge. Nothing to be waiting on, nothing to be waiting for. Just text MANDATE to 510-405-4549 to join our efforts to deliver a mandate from Black America. Uh, and thank you, of course, to Black to the Future Action Fund for convening us all together. Uh, okay, so when former President Barack Obama was elected in 2008, uh, many who had worked to get him there saw it difficult to actually push the former president to deliver the hope and change that he inspired in millions. We can't make that mistake again. We must push this administration to make good on the mandate that Black voters brought with us to the polls. Here to talk with us about the mandate, two of my favorite folks. Everybody here has been my favorite, uh, for sure, but 
these two folks in particular, definitely two of uh, my favorite, favorite folks, if you will. Uh, we have Latasha Brown, co-founder of Black Voters Matter, and the good Reverend Al Sharpton, founder and CEO of National Action Network. And let me tell you a little bit about both of these two tremendous individuals. Now, Latasha is an award-winning visionary thought leader and institution builder, cultural activist and artist and connector. She is the co-founder of Black Voters Matter, as I said, uh, Black Voters Matter Fund and Black Voters Matter Capacity Building Institute, the visionary founder and co-anchor of a regional network called the Southern Black Girls and Women's Consortium. That sounds very important. A uh, hundred million, which is, and it is very important because it's a hundred million dollar 10 year initiative to invest in organizations that serve black women and girls and create a new approach to philanthropy by allowing every component of the program inception to from inception to execution to be created by black girls and women in the South. Uh, the good Reverend Al Sharpton is, of course, an internationally renowned civil rights leader, founder and president of the National Action Network, which has more than 100 chapters across the country hailed by former President Barack Obama as, quote, a champion for the downtrodden. Reverend Sharpton is the host of Politics Nation on MSNBC, which is a nationally syndicated daily radio show. Um, he also has that called Keeping It Real and a nationally broadcast radio show on Sunday called The Hour of Power. Uh, he's authored three books. Um, Reverend Sharpton is a frequent lecturer on civil rights and political issues. He has received numerous awards including the Harold Washington Award from the Congressional Black Caucus. He was also honored with the Mandela Legacy Hope Success and Empowerment Award in recognition of his long history of achievements in advancing civil rights causes around the world. In 2017, he received the prestigious James Joyce Award from the Literary and Historical Society of the University College in Dublin, Ireland. Uh, he is the proud father of two daughters, Dominique and Ashley, and the grandfather of Marcus Al Sharpton Bright. And for me personally, he also was a champion when I was going through my thing with ESPN. So I will always appreciate Reverend Sharpton, um, just as I have done since I was a little girl, like most of us. Um, all right, with those intros out of the way, Latasha, I'm going to start with you. Um, you and Cliff, y'all had the blackest bus in America through the southern, the southern region of the United States. Uh, you work to activate and engage our communities to exercise our power. I mean, you've been very consistent in saying that it is about us. You know, a lot of people think that Black people showed up in support of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris because we have some natural affinity or emotional attachment to them. No, as you pointed out so appropriately, it was always about us. So talk with us about what it means to leverage our power in this moment. Why do we need a mandate for the Biden-Harris administration? Which side are you on? <laughs> Which side are you on? Which side are you on, people? Which side are you on? That's a song that actually was written by Pete Seeger, and they used to sing that in the civil rights movement. And my grandmother, I used to hear her sing it, and I raised it because I think that's a question that we have to place literally with those that we support. Which side are you on? Because we showed up for you, right? It is an imperative that you also show up. Understanding what a mandate, when I, we talk about mandate, the mandate just didn't start. Let me tell you, the mandate, even if you look at the definition of a mandate, you know, the definition of a mandate is an official order or commission to do something. A second definition, if you go to it right now, it says the authority to carry out a policy or course of action regarded as given by an electorate or a candidate to a candidate or a party um, and victorious in an election. The bottom line is that the entire pathway of Joe Biden, um, of President Biden and Vice President Harris getting to office, the foundation and the impetus and what was catalytic of making that happen was black folk. And so we didn't, as you said, Jamil, we didn't elect them because we were like, oh, we like them, you know, or that they're our friends. This is really wasn't about even participation. This is about power. And so when we're talking about a mandate, one, let's talk about the mandate. One, we cleared the field for you. We created the path in South Carolina for you to be the nominee. Number two, we actually delivered the White House. As we said, we came out and threw out when we're looking at um, Pennsylvania and Michigan um, and Wisconsin and Georgia, 
black the black vote make the difference in making sure that those states actually were blue that so we literally delivered the white house and then on top of that the third piece is we actually delivered the senate which meant that we gave you the best possible circumstances to govern so when we created we cleared the pathway like it's kind of like in a football game like when we cleared the pathway that we set up offense that we gave you the best con conditions defense to, for offense we expect you to deliver right and so i think it's really important when we're talking about you know as we go forward and what, what when we're talking about a mandate you know that at the end of the day i do want us to kind of shift this paradigm of how we see politics that we're going to go to those who we have put in office to ask them to support our agenda that's kind of backwards ain't it y'all like if we think about who in the world actually hire somebody and the person that they hire we got to beg them to work for us that ain't how this works the way it works is if i hire you I hired you, I commissioned you for a job. And so I think we have to approach this process in that way. And that's why I'm so glad that Black to the Future, I'm so glad that Alicia as a visionary and all in, in her vision around, we have to be proactive about what it is that we need for our community in terms of moving that forward. And what does that look like? And literally, I think part of it is not just in the clearing of the path, it's to make sure that we are holding them accountable. Now, I think the part of the mandate is really a holding them accountable, being clear and proactive around what our vision is. You know, that, you know, when we're talking about what happened and what is happening right now, you know, the fact that it should even be unconscionable for us to think about, we should have been the first people that the administration was coming to ask around what it is that we need. You know, when we're talking about voting rights, I just think that it's poetic, and I raise this often, that I think about voting rights that two years ago, the nation witnessed where black folk in Georgia, like literally when we saw voter suppression, that our votes were suppressed. And so it's interesting that two years fast forwarded, those very same black folk, like literally in many ways, the fate of the country, the fate of democracy, right, in places like New York and D.C. and other places, had to depend on those same very black folk, right, to come and deliver the best conditions in, in, in which to govern. And so when we're talking about literally why we need a mandate, it is why we need the accountability to actually enforce the mandate that we already had. Like part of putting in office wasn't about a popularity contest. And it wasn't while there was a, an element of that, of course, it was to stop fascism and Trump, that fundamentally what we are supporting, what we are pushing is that we want an agenda that is going to materially change the lives of our people, that we want an agenda that literally is going to center that just like we didn't leave anything on the field, we put it out on the field, that as hard as you expected and as hard as we showed up and worked and cleared the path for you to make the conditions, the best in terms of for you to operate and for you to govern, we expect you to use that power, right? We expect you to do the same for us, to clear the field for us, to really stamp out institutional racism, to speak to it, but also make sure that you're prioritizing that, the administration is prioritizing that within their agenda to clear the field, to literally make sure that we are able to live in the best possible conditions so that we can actually fulfill our dreams in this nation as well. Uh, I know uh, that, you know, Reverend is the Reverend, but uh, Latasha, if you had a collection plate, I would put some money in it right now <laughs> based off everything that you just said. Uh, look, we know that the history of this country, whenever there has been any sense of Black empowerment, that it has been met with strong rebuke, and it has often been met with progress going in the other direction. Now, we just saw a whole bunch of white nationalists deliver their mandate on January 6th as hundreds of them stormed the Capitol and attempted to literally overthrow the government. Now, their cries of election fraud, of course, hit home with us the hardest because they seem to take umbrage with the fact that so many Black voters stood in line for hours, battled misinformation, battled disinformation in the middle of a pandemic to bring our agenda to the polls. Now, seeing that display is clear even more so that we really don't have any time to waste. So what does it look like uh, for us to continue to deliver our mandate in these conditions? 
So I want to kind of look at this in kind of three parts. The first thing is, let me say, what we saw happen in the state capitol on January 6th is what black folks experience every single day in this country, right? We experience that every day. Every single day, we have, just like there is an attack on the capitol, there's an attack on black lives every single day. There's an attack on black lives in terms of how white supremacy is allowed to create abject poverty, the conditions through structural racism of poverty that we're seeing black men and black women who are shot down like dogs in the street, right, that there is an attack. If you're saying, if pe there are people that are more upset for folks literally taking a podium than the actual murder of black folk who are like literally with their families or the, the fact that a man is shot in his back seven times while his children watch. So yes, when we're talking about the attack of capital, that is one thing, but it's the same energy, the same spirit, the same thought that is literally attacking black people every single day of our lives in this country. The second thing is we were talking about how we're, the, they weaponized the flag. That what we saw on the Capitol is we saw the Confederate flag flying through and we saw where the actual United States flag, that they used the flag to actually beat an officer so much so that one officer has lost his eye, right? That is what happens to us every day. Call, um, Kaepernick, that was literally weaponizing, that using and hiding behind what was American exceptionalism that literally is only a cloak around white supremacy. That literally this notion that American is exceptional and beyond reproach, that using this cloak that America is a democracy when in fact um, America at its best Democracy is aspirational. It has not been achieved as the Constitution lays it out, as the Declaration of Independence lay it out. The third thing I think that is really important that we can see the parallels from what happened to on January 6th and what we see now is that there was this ongoing piece around we don't want the vote to go down there. That same kind of attack on the vote in Electoral College is the same exact attack that says we don't want black people to vote. We There's an, a constant attack. So I think we can look at what happened at the Capitol as a microcosm of what happens to black people every single day of our lives in this country and why it really creates the space for us to really talk about this question around democracy and this administration to know and to take it seriously that literally when you don't check those things, when you don't check structural racism, when you don't check this notion, this anti-democratic movement, that what you see all across the board is what we witnessed and, and January 6th, that many of us, you know, I often say that yes, Trump was a problem, which is why we worked so hard to get him out. He represented fascism, but all my life I've been dealing with Trumps. I'm from Alabama, right? I can tell you about some Trumps, right? And I can tell you about the Trumps that we still continue to deal with, even as I live in Georgia. The second part that I'll say just kind of quickly related into that is that as we organize, we have to also think, which is why I love um, the name of this organization. Like one, we have to really understand that we're doing a defensive and an offensive strategy because we're trying to win the game, right? If you're a good football team, you know, you need a good defense and you need a good offense. And so I think part of in our defense is literally the work that we're doing around voter engagement work to make sure that our people are organized because organized power is realized power to do this work so that we, at the very least, that we can actually reduce the harm to our people. But we're also very honest that although the majority of my life has been dedicated around civic engagement and voting, I'm also very clear that voting in itself is not gonna be for the liberation of black folks, right? That it is one vehicle, right, to actually create some space and the opportunity to reduce the harm to my community and to make sure that we're using our agency to determine what governs us, who governs us and who represents us and how the allocation of resources. But while we're doing that, we also have to do this other body of work, um, which leads to why I'm saying I love the name of this organization. We have to radically reimagine every single system in this country that we can't just keep saying, well, let's fit what the founders want intended. Because the truth of the matter is the founders couldn't even see the they were so limited in their vision. They couldn't even see the humanity of any of us that are speaking right now, that fundamentally we have to think of ourselves as black futurists. That one, while we're working on what we need to do now, right, while we're reducing the harm in our community, while we're creating the policies to literally be able to get us, like my grandmother would just say, from pillar to post, that what we also have to do is we have to spend some time radically re reimagining different systems, different ways of being, not saying, oh, we can't do that, we've never done that before, but what is needed that we can actually advance humanity, that we can advance the conditions of our community. You know, and the last thing I'll say um, is really around, I think of this as in three boxes, that if we are thinking about how do we show up in this space around power, I think we have to think about one, 
we have to have a vision, right? A vision that goes far beyond. We have to think of ourselves as black futurists or what is our vision of the nation that we want to live in? I often ask the question around what would America look like without racism? And unfortunately, no matter where I ask that question, half to the majority of the room cannot answer it. How can we actually ever end racism when we can't even envision systems without racism? We've got to acknowledge we've got to create new systems. The second thing is around voice. Like literally the other box, we've got to lift up our voices, you all, that part of our power is being able to speak truth to power, right? And literally being able to, to help people to see something greater, right? Then they've seen that vision that we're putting forth, that if we put the vision forth, not just operate out of a space of fear, but operate out of a space of our people can see all the power and the possibilities and give voice to that, that in itself can actually help people be engaged in a different way. And the last and the final thing that I'll say is we really got to talk about values. You know, while I am, um, my work has been rooted in this notion of democracy, let me be real clear. My work ain't about democracy. Democracy ain't the end goal for me. Democracy is only as good as it is facilitating the advancement of humanity. And so for me, democracy is a means to an end, not an end in itself, because this is a nation that has killed people in the name of democracy. This is a nation that has exploited the resources around the world and dropped bombs on innocent children in Palestine and in and other places or supported those efforts in the name of democracy. Ultimately, what all of this is for is for humanity. And so we have to center this notion around the protection and the love of humanity in our work and literally enfold our community in a vision that's far greater than what we see now. Well, uh, Latasha, I know I, for one, am constantly amused by uh, people who like to bring the framers into this and talk about what the founding fathers would have wanted. I'm like, yeah, they would have wanted most of us not to be eligible to vote or to own property. They intended it to be minority rule because they only intended white men to enjoy the democracy, the property rights, and the fruits of everyone else's labor. So adhering to the whims of people who only imagined this place when it was 13 colonies and not 300 and something million people sure seems very short-sighted to me. Um, Reverend Sharpton, I want to bring you in now. Uh, look, um, Latasha talked about this. You know, Black people didn't get behind Joe Biden and Kamala Harris because of affection, because we like them. And when it comes to Joe Biden in particular, I would say our community, I think an appropriate, accurate description was probably lukewarm. Now, he had a town hall this week, and I think it made it even more clear about why we need to push for a mandate and push it hard. So as someone who's been in this fight for as long as you have, what can we learn from the last decade of organizing and pushing to build and wield political power that has to be applied today? I think that what we've learned is that we only are going to get what we fight for. And even though some may be better mannered, it does not mean that they're going to do what is right for our agenda. We are not fans. We are grown folks that have the power of our vote and our dollar. And the reason that I think what is being done tonight is so important is that they try to play us against each other. We learn that if we do what we do, even if we do it differently, even if we approach it with different tactics, we have got to go for the same goals. I agree with Latasha. What happened January 6th at the Capitol happened to Eric Garner when a policeman can choke him to death and they let him go. It happened to Michael Brown and Ferguson, when a man can shoot him in cold blood and let him go. So we've been going through this for the last decade, but what we showed by showing up and voting out Trump and voting in Biden and Harris is our power. They were not our power. They're the result of our power. Therefore, they must be made, made clear that just as much as we use our power for, we can use it against. And we must realize that we are the power. The mandate is clear. We use demonstration, organizing, all of that. They must legislate. They must do HR1. They must deal with the George Floyd Policing and Justice Act. They must deal with uh, the, uh, the HR40, with the, uh, the instituting of, of, of reparations. And they must deal 
with the John Lewis Protection Voting Act because we laid all that out while it was running. This is no accident. The beauty of tonight is to enforce a mandate that they committed to to get our votes. I know Joe Biden for years. I marched against Joe Biden with the crime bill. So we can go either way. And I think that all of us must stand together, support this fund, and say that we are together. Whatever disagreements we have uh, don't amount to anything that amounts and that has measured to the, the, the plight that our people has had. So I think it is important that we stand together, that we do what we do. We had different tribes in Africa but we were all African. And when they came to get us and enslave us and kidnap us to bring us to enslavement, they didn't ask us what tribe we came from. They saw Africans that were sold. They need to see Africans that may have different fingers, but that's one fist and that we're gonna to fight together. And that's what I think is the magic of what Alicia is doing tonight. And with all of us coming on together to say, we are with this mandate. We didn't vote for you because we were your fans. We were voting for you because you were the alternative to what was there. Now prove you were the alternative by dealing with those of us that presented a mandate and you committed that you would enforce it. One of the things that was pretty noticeable after President Barack Obama uh, got elected was that it seemed to be um, such a collective sigh of relief that it seemed to be a time where uh, we were patting ourselves on the back for finally electing a black president to the point where people took their foot off the gas. The energy changed where it was very vigilant and then it kind of went away. And that was somewhat reflected in uh, what happened at the midterms when, frankly, a lot of us did not show up to vote. Now, of course, because we have spent the last four years just in a bit of a uh, experiencing some emotional trauma ourselves, dealing with Donald Trump and all the nonsense that he brought in, that in this moment, you see a lot of people celebrating, a lot of people like, oh, it's so glad to return to normal. You've heard that used over and over again. But with that comes complacency. So, uh, Rev, how do we guard against letting that complacency, complacency settle in, particularly since a lot of us are basking in the fact that we now have a black vice president, a black woman who's a vice president. How do we ward off making sure we don't fall into the familiar pattern of just being okay with how things are? Two things. One is that we can't ever allow the conversation to be, let's go back to normal. Normal didn't work for us. Normal was Trayvon Martin. Normal, normal was Eric Ghana. Normal was our being a uh, uh, attempt of what white wealth is in this country. So one, it was not about returning to normal. Second, we must re realize that when the, we elected Barack Obama and then reelected, then many of us felt, oh, we had reached the promised land, a black president. Well, those of us that's been out here knows that every time you move forward, there's going to be a reaction. After the Civil War in Lincoln, but reluctantly let uh, some of the enslaved join the Union Army, and they won the Civil War. Don't ever forget the Confederates would have won had he not bowed to the pressure and bowed to the fact he was losing, that they put Blacks in the Union Army, and the Union Army was backed up by Blacks that had been slaves that fought. So in many ways, Lincoln didn't free the slaves. The slaves freed Lincoln. We knew there would be a backlash. They came with reconstruction, backlash. By the turn of the 20th century, we lost all of those that we had elected. We had 22 members of Congress black, lost all of that, backlash. If you look at the civil rights movement, Dr. King, John Lewis, Fannie Lou Hamer, Ella Baker, we made some progress, got Voting Rights Act, got Civil Rights Act. What happened? Backlash. Nixon was elected in 68, followed only by four years of Carter, Reagan, Bush, then Bush Jr. after Clinton with triangulation. Backlash. We should have known that after Obama, there would be a backlash. The backlash was Donald Trump. I'm from New York. We battled with Trump for decades. We marched on Trump about the Central Park Five. Trump was the reaction, the backlash to not just 
Obama, but to those that elected Obama. We must realize our strength. Our strength is the same as it was for our forefathers that backed up the Union Army. We must back up these people now and say we did not put you there for symbolism. We are past the Jackie Robinson days. We don't want a black in the game. We want to win the game. Mm. Um, you remind me of something that I often say to people. You know, for me, it used to be about getting my foot into the room or getting into the room and maybe even holding the door open for others to get in the room. But I realized that once you get in the room, you got to change the whole room. That it can't just be about this incremental progress of being the first or breaking that initial glass ceiling is that you have to disrupt and change, break down, maybe even hammer the system that existed there before you. So uh, I hear you, Rev, for sure. Um, listen, I just want to thank all of you all who joined us tonight, uh, not that just those watching from afar, but obviously uh, the very powerful speakers that we heard from tonight who offered so much for us to think about offered so many words for us to be inspired by. And most importantly, I think the underlined word that needs to be in bold is mandate. You know, that's asking for something. That's a demand. That is not um, something that we are referring to a pleasantry, if you will. Like, this is a demand. So that means that there's action involved. It's an ask that there's got to be something met on the other end of it. So with that said, if you haven't done it yet, please text MANDATE to 510-405-4549 to join our efforts to deliver a mandate, all caps, <laughs> um, from Black America. Be a part of the change that we demand, demand to see. Uh, let's fight to win. So take the pledge and most importantly, try to get a friend to do the same as well. Now, we will be back next week with an event on Tuesday giving you all the myths and facts about the COVID-19 and the vaccines. Uh, please follow Black to the Future Action Fund on all socials and everyone stay safe, stay vigilant, stay encouraged, stay inspired, and of course, have a wonderful night. Good night.